So if you're joining us for the very first time and you haven't heard about Startup Grind, um, we are a global organization um, for the entrepreneurs, innovators, um, in tech, but, but not only, um, with 600 chapters across the globe, 125 countries, and a community of uh, almost 5 million members. Our values are, as a community, is to give first, to make friends, not contacts, and to help others before you help yourself. Uh, we are on a mission to give startups everywhere and entrepreneurs and, and founders everywhere um, the education opportunities, um, access to whatever they need in order to build their companies and scale. So we support them from the very ideation stage to, to the moment where they actually are growing and scaling up. Uh, this event today uh, is part of a Startup Grind Women's Month celebrated in all our chapters across the globe as a result of the partnership with Silicon Valley Bank and Comcast NBC Universal Lift Labs. So welcome everyone to Inspiring Women uh, to Lead Innovation UK uh, Women in Tech Summit. We have invited founders, connectors, leaders and uh, investors to celebrate the roles that women play in the ecosystem. And so uh, we were lucky to have women actually from across the UK. The summit seeks to reshape the perceptions that technology and tech leadership is uh, led by men and uh, is a joint effort of the chapters in uh, Scotland, um, in uh, Liverpool, uh, Isle of Man and Newcastle and, and Leeds. I would like to bring Simon Hodgkins to the stage. Uh, Simon is going to co-host the event today with me. Uh, Simon, could you could you say a few words about yourself? I Over can, to you. and, and uh, it's Hello. fantastic, fantastic to be here. Thank you so much indeed for inviting me to share some time with you all today, and to thank you to everybody who's joining us uh, and watching in uh, for what promises to be a really interesting discussion. So look, I'm Simon Hodgkins. I'm going to be hosting and kicking off the very first session uh, in this Women in Tech Summit. And we're, we're going to be talking all about uh, women leading UK innovation. I'm the, the founder of something called the Think Global Forum. You can see it behind me, thinkglobalforum.org. I'm also the CMO, Chief Marketing Officer for an organization called Vistatech, and quite a number of other hats that I wear. So it's a pleasure to be here, and I'm delighted to be kicking off this first session at this very important uh, UK Women in Tech Summit. Thank you, Simon. Well, let's get started then. Fantastic. Okay. Well, look, uh, thanks very much, everybody. Uh, I'm going to be uh, introducing some people uh, in a moment, but I, I just wanted to just recap on what we're what we're hoping to get out of today's summit. Obviously, um, it's important that we share what it's like to be a woman leading a technology company today. And we've been joined by some experts and some leaders in the technology sector to help us unpack that a little bit. But we also want to be talking about the particular challenges that we're seeing uh, throughout and also to maybe explore things when it comes to things like challenges that are particular to women in tech but also maybe around things like um raising finance and what the implications are for that i think simon's probably trying to reconnect yeah. uh so he, he should be with us in uh in a couple of minutes uh what i'd like to do is to invite um Mel, Carlin, uh, Sheila and Carmen on the stage uh, while we wait for Simon. So um, please, ladies, if you could join us. We, we and, can start uh, introducing ourselves while we wait. Exactly. For him. Yes. Um, shall we start with Carmen then? Yeah, sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Carmen. I'm based in London and I'm the co-founder and CEO of a company called Ivy Tech. We're actually a service company and we provide startups and scale ups with remote software teams. So we're a staff augmentation team um, and we build long term relationships both with our teams as well as with the clients, which has been working really well. And we're yeah head deep into the startup scene. We've been um, running our development teams out of Ukraine um primarily up until recently we've still got a lot of people in ukraine 
which is amazing. Um, but obviously with the war, we've been pivoting into different countries as well and are now um, expanding a bit quicker than we had planned. So um, that is an interesting challenge or maybe a great opportunity we've got ahead of us this year. Amazing, thank um, you. Thank you, Carmen. Um, Mel, over to you. Thank you, thank you. Hi, I'm Mel, Mel Elliott. I'm a principal at Show Valley Ventures. And we are a seed stage uh, investment fund. We have our fund two, which we're active on at the moment, which is a 95 million fund. It's UK wide, and we're really focused on disruptive uh, software companies and platforms uh, with global ambition. Um, our sweet spots are our, our core tiers, I suppose, as I've described them, are immersive tech, so AR, VR, AI, we've done quite a lot in esport and e gaming, metaverse, uh, cyber security, and Internet of Things. And a typical Ticket size for us would be somewhere between 750,000 to probably about 1.25 million. Um, previously, I've worked with, uh, well, across all the major northern ecosystems, working with great tech founders um, and tech investors. Uh, I've also worked with the founding team, joined the founding team of a biotech based in Yorkshire. So I know the pain involved in. Uh, working inside a high growth business and I've also got a lot of passion for diversity uh, and inclusion specifically within the STEM sector um, and I founded Include Me which is a community platform for entrepreneurs in the north. So I shall pass over. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Caroline. Thank you and hello. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Carolyn Pearson. Uh, I'm the founder of a company called Maiden Voyage. We've been going since 2008 and we specialise in inclusive travel safety, travel security for large organisations. So it's a B2B uh, organisation. I'm also chief exec of an organisation called Inevent Digital, I'm drawing on my sort of 20 odd years in corporate technology where I manage tech teams for companies such as EasyJet, BBC, ITV and Sony Music. Um, and our sweet spot is helping organisations to set up their digital centres of excellence. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Sheila, over to you. Hi everyone, I'm Sheila Hogan, Chief Exec and Founder of Biscuit Tin. We are a, a death tech SaaS company um, and we're on a mission to uh, disrupt the way we um, plan for and hand, uh, end of life and um, also life closed down. We want to enable and empower everyone to plan in advance um, for something that's inevitable um, to create a digital legacy to be proud of and make a real difference um, to those that they leave behind. All born from my personal experience of having to close down the lives of my parents, armed with an old biscuit tin full of old papers um, and finding out that the whole thing's broken completely. Um, so we're on a mission to uh, be the global household brand in digital legacy within five years and uh, and disrupt this whole space so yeah that's us thank you no thank you very much um that's um well you you all bring quite a lot of um a lot of expertise uh on the panel since simon's still joining i'm really not sure why what's what's happened but um let me let me start i i do have uh, the questions so we should we should be fine and hopefully who will be with us in a in a few minutes so um what are the challenges for the women in technology that's uh that's the topic of, of the session so let's start with that do, what, what do you think are there any challenges that are specific for women in technology is there um who would like to start yeah I, I think there are i think from from my perspective we've got a lot of you know a lot of experience in the room so it'll be interesting to see everybody's uh, perspectives but from mine I've, I've worked in this industry for 
lots and lots of years and it makes no sense to me that we don't have uh, you know more women in tech that we don't have a more diverse set of of people just generally in tech and, and yet we don't i think things have improved but they're nowhere near the kind of level that i'd expect and, and that i'd i'd like um specifically kind of women in tech i think i think we don't have enough role models and i think I think we've got a tendency to be perhaps a little bit shy and not kind of shout about our successes and maybe put ourselves into the spotlight as much. But I think, I think you know, from my perspective, from a funding side, and I'm seeing a lot of companies, you know, there's there's not enough women in tech. So I certainly do agree with that point. Caroline, would you agree with that? Um, so, I mean, the statistics say that that's an issue, but I have to say it's not been my personal experience. I, I fell into tech when I was 16 and then went on to university and did my degree and, and other things along the way part time. But um, I think I think Mel's right that, you know, I've never been as a northerner backwards at coming forwards, so I've not been shy. Um, and therefore, I think I've got really, you know, I mean, of course, we all come across people in our careers where, you know, people are inappropriate or they block us, but not necessarily from, a, you know, gender specific. Some of my best bosses have been guys. In fact, when I was working at ITV and I came up with the idea um, to launch Maiden Voyage, my boss at the time, sort of said, you know, I think it's a brilliant idea. And as long as, you, you know, there's no conflict of interest, then crack yeah. on and, and, and do it in your spare time. Um, and likewise, when um, I was growing the business, I was presenting at Cranfield School of Management. And one of my core panelists was a, a man who actually said to me afterwards, I really love your business. Are you looking for investment? Um, and at the time, I wasn't. And, and no, we started this this you know angel investor courtship of about four years where eventually it kind of wore me down and persuaded me to take investment and to scale the business um and likewise when i have been managing tech teams you know i've always grown and recruited good female talent always had more than 50 percent of women in the teams um, and in fact i've just done a, a project for a client now where we set up a digital center of excellence and we're about 75 percent uh, women in the team so Whilst, you know, the industry and the statistics say otherwise, I've only had fairly good experiences to date. Great. Well, thank you. Simon, um, I see you managed to rejoin. I'm, I'm really sorry. <laughs> I don't, don't know what happened, but I'm really glad um, we we kicked off. So I will, um, we, we started with the que first question. Um, I will leave it to you right now, okay? If that's okay. Is, yeah, no, it's absolutely fine sure what happens so i suppose with a tech event you expect a tech challenge um, so apologies to everybody i did disappear into the uh, the magic of the internet for a little while but I, I think i'm back we will see if i disappear again somebody jump in and rescue the day uh, I, I so look try. we're talking about the first we're talking about the first part of this conversation and you know i was very uh, very delighted to be here with carmen and sheila and carolyn and of course mel uh, to discuss all these important uh, points. So um, in terms of the finance landscape um, and in terms of the challenges for women in technology, I'm assuming you guys have already jumped in and started to share some of these challenges and experiences. So where are we up to? And then I can maybe take it from there. Uh, we have just heard from Mel and Carolyn about um, what challenges they see or have experienced as women in tech. Um, and I guess I've uh, wanted to say on that point that similar to, um, well, uh, I run uh, the IT sourcing company and although we actually have quite a few, I think we're 35 or 40 percent women in our team, but a lot of these women are in management, which is fantastic, but we have very, very few female software developers. And that is kind of our bread and butter. And we have women in t uh, like in the tech teams, but they're mainly QAs and business analysts. So um, I, I've, you know, I'm wondering, uh, is the female brain wired differently that um, women aren't tend to go into that field as much? Um, I think it's becoming more and more accessible to women. I think it used to be also just a very male um, heavy domain. I am really glad to see 
women getting into tech though and kind of the uh, management and the kind of back office side of things which is really exciting and I know I get a lot of feedback from especially my fe female team members um, that say how wonderful it is for them to have a, a female business owner and um, I have a baby as well and just for them to see okay you can be a woman you can be in tech you can have a family and it is possible and I know it means so much to them because they're all young girls and they like you said Mel I think there's a real lack of role models and I feel like I've been making role models myself and it is so nice to and I don't have all the answers but to be there for these younger uh, co-workers of mine and occasionally you know put an arm around their shoulder or encourage them or um, even just live the day to day with them and show them that it's possible. Carmen, uh, some great points there. And do you feel as a a, a woman founder with uh, women developers, do you feel that that's very unique in your particular field? Like, is it is it sort of as rare as a unicorn, or do you feel the landscape is changing? Um. I think it's changing. I mean, I have most of my co-workers in Ukraine. Um, so, and they're working in IT is probably one of the best jobs you can have. Even if you're in recruitment, it's one of the best paying jobs in the country. I mean, if you're a software developer, you live like a king, which is amazing. So I'm really happy to participate in kind of that generation of a country that actually earns the money I believe they deserve. Um, so in Ukraine, a lot of women try and push to get into IT because it means securing a really great future for their families. And I find that exciting and I'm really excited to be part of that. And I think, but even in the UK, I mean, you ladies can probably say a bit more to that because you have probably a lot more colleagues here in the UK, but I see, you know, more and more women getting into tech as well. Uh, on the software side of things, I find it quite slow. I think I don't, just don't see really good female software developers. I don't know if someone has different experience or where I can find them because I often have clients coming to me because they're all startups and scale-ups. They all deal with the topic of diversity. They're very passionate about diverse teams and they say, Carmen, can you put a team together for me of 10 developers, but I want 50% to be female. And I'm like, I don't know if I can find you that many female um, backend developers. So it is still a real struggle. Thanks, thanks, Carmen. And it's interesting your point because the, this world of remote working to work remotely, and you're kind of that a little bit because you're saying that you know people in Ukraine are they're, they're getting into tech, and it's allowing them to get into tech, and it's also providing a little bit of that financial security, which of course is important and allowing access maybe to that global marketplace that maybe wasn't there in previous generations, you know. Carolyn, was it yourself we had to hear from last? No, I've already spoken. I think Sheila, she would. It's Sheila probably would me, yeah, it's probably me. <laughs> I, I mean, my my kind of like, like Carolyn, um, I mean, I've never been backward at coming forward. I've been in tech since I left school at 16 um, and, and always kind of been in that area and gone through lots of um, buzzwords and cycles and different ways of doing the same thing, um, which we tend to, to kind of go through in this space. But um, in terms of the, the female thing, it's always been a male dominated environment. Um, and, and for me, although um, there are steps and, and there are, you know, um, I would hope it is getting better. I am still seeing the same. I mean, trying to, I'm just recruiting for my tech lead, um, you know, at the moment for my internal team, having worked with a, um, you know, an agency prior to this. And it, they are like, um, a unicorn like you suggested Simon as far as I'm concerned I can't find any female as much as we've tried um and and that that technical lead is gonna have to be male and you know you know my team is you know as much as I'm against this because I've always been into kind of like you know the diversity um thing I was president of you know Scottish Business Women's Association and things like that and and women on boards and, and a big advocate of that but um, for my own I'm thinking oh my goodness it's driven it's it's male at the moment apart from me the founder you know the the kind of key resource that I'm having to bring on board you know in in here is is male and I, I'm you know I will have to tackle that um 
but right now at this early stage, I just need to get us moving. So I'm going to have to go with, um, you know, with what we've got. And even finding a male tech lead will be a challenge. <laughs> it's yeah. such a crazy hiring market. It's, it's, it's really hard I, I, to pick all the boxes at the moment. Touch yeah. wood, I've had some stellar candidates and I'm about yeah. to offer next week, but uh, yeah, oh, yeah. Um, so yeah, quite exciting, but, but yeah, a bit of a disappointment that I, that, that I've no female candidates at all, not even in the selection process, right. Um, to get to the shortlist, never mind being in the shortlist. Um, yeah. It's interesting at the, at the time of recording, we're seeing that some of the very large tech companies are actually laying off staff, particularly in the U S markets. And, and yet when it comes to sort of your local business and trying to find that all important tech hire, it's still a, it's still something we need to work on significantly because there is that lack that you're referring to, Sheila. So in the, I, I make sure I haven't missed anybody when we're talking about the, that first piece. Everybody's spoken. So I'd like to, in the interest of time, because we, you know, I have sort of lost a little bit of time here. I want to maybe move the conversation on if I can, and talk about the financial landscape. We've talked a bit about the people landscape there and some of the challenges uh, for women in tech. But when it comes to the finance landscape. When you talk about male dominance, it still seems to be from a, you know an outsider looking in, very male dominated still. Uh, and I've wanted to raise the question with this panel about, you know, are the VC women funding women? Is there are you seeing a lack of women VCs? And when you are raising money for your own business, whether that's been in the past or if you're potentially looking to raise funds in the future. Uh, how are you looking at that landscape? Are you seeing that 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 is a, a similar challenge to a resourcing challenge when it comes to funding? Who'd like to kick us off? I, I'll, I can pick off there, sure. Simon. Um, yeah, because I've just recently done my first round of SEIS um, investment. I'm on the circuit again, though, for the next round. Um, we can't rest on our laurels too much in this world. Um, but um, yeah, so. I mean, I, I, again, you know, in terms of there are, you know, more, um, you know, female, even angel investors, and um, there are some female driven funds, um, you know, around there now and these diversity kind of like driven um, funds. But um, I found the whole, um, you know, the whole thing, pretty challenging to be fair um I found right just understanding when you've never done this before I mean I've run businesses for you know for 30 years but never businesses that I want to scale up like I want to do with this and never needed um you know some equity um before so it was completely and utterly new subject for me um so getting into that trying to learn the lingo trying to get some support to to kind of like you know help you communicate with investors in the way that they you know they need you to it's a different language it's it's you know it, it's you know it is like speaking you know a different language completely I mean having done presentations from a whole of my corporate life and other businesses and stuff like that you know suddenly the stuff that I'm doing is not resonating and I need you know that specialism to to come in but in terms of you know most of these investment committees that I came across were male dominated. And, you know, there were, there was maybe the token, token female um, that might have been the, the kind of associate or the, the facilitator um, bringing you on board. But most of the actual decision makers in terms of that I experienced were male and, and I have to say white male right so it was still very very kind of like dominated by that old school um and you know way of thinking and there's no doubt about it that when their decision when they're making decisions there there is a um there's still an unconscious bias there of um you know because that's what the stats are saying you know only eight percent of all vc money goes to females you know um, yeah, I was that. To up on that. Yeah, thank, thanks, Sheila. Because Jesse in the chat has asked that, do you think age has played a part in that from a, a VC or a fund round, a funding round? Um, you know, does age play a part in that? You know, when we talk, think about 
uh, female, young, male, older, you mentioned sort of uh, male dominated and predominantly white. So the lack of diversity in the in the fundraising seems to be very apparent, doesn't it? It is, it is. Yeah. yeah. And just to your point about the stats, I was looking at TechCrunch um, and they, they were reporting back in 2020 now, so a little while ago, they said that only percent of VC funding, all funding, went to women, which is incredibly, incredibly small. And then I, I looked, at well, what, what's it like more recently? And venture capital funding was at an all time high, believe it or not, during 2021. But still companies that were started and ran by women, they will only receive just over 2% of the funds again. And that was against the backdrop of VC funding being incredibly high, uh, which is the smallest share according to TechCrunch since 2016. So even though it was an exceptionally strong year for VC investment, particularly across the market, where it's sort of these previous records, almost 330 billion in the US market alone, out of that 330 billion, only 6.4% went to female founded startups. Yeah. Uh, Pitchbook, Pitchbook also uh, mentioned that statistic as well as TechCrunch. So, um, is that your experience? Is that what you guys are seeing when it comes to investment? You know, Sheila, you're sort of saying, look, I, I found it. I needed help with the lingo. Hadn't really done that kind of thing before, but it was just male dominated. Is that is that common uh, like when you go out looking for finances? Are you finding that a challenge for a woman founded business or does it make no difference? A VC is a VC. I'll let somebody else speak to and rather than monopolise it. I'd be yeah. quite interested to ask the question. Um, if only 2% went to women, let, is, is there a statistic about the number of people who pitched and got the money? Because actually, I made a conscious choice not to go down the VC route because um, I'm, I've made my business an emotional business. It's not something that I want to scale and sell quickly. Um, and therefore, for me, it was important that I had a, a, a good relationship with my angel investor and actually relatability. Um, and therefore, I didn't want a traditional hard nosed cutthroat VC investor who was looking to flip me for maximum profit. Um, and therefore, it, it wasn't a particularly a route that I went um, to. And actually, when I have been on the investor you know, eco um, circuit, really. I think a lot of people have said to me that, yes, that people look at the figures, but actually they also look at the entrepreneur. Do they like them? Can they work with them? Do they trust them? Um, are they, you know, relatable? And, and actually one of the things that helped me in my corporate career, and I think which has helped me in my business, is actually being able to speak finance. Um, so years after I finished my degree, I went off and did an MBA. And I felt that actually in the corporate world, if I can pitch a business case to a, a CFO or a chief exec, which showed them, you know, return on investment for, you know, maybe a big tech project, then actually I had more credibility in the boardroom. So I don't know if it's just entrepreneur speak, but also finance speak, which is useful. Yeah, thanks, Karen. Uh, Eugene made an interesting observation in the chat and Eugene says that the number is much higher in the eastern US uh, with diverse teams, including a female founder. And his, his comment is about that the numbers being that I was quoting there are for female teams with no male and generally no minorities and that not all VCs are equal. And I suppose there's some truth in that and it's suggesting things like first round capital, B capital, first steps capital. So, you know, we are seeing some changes when it comes to uh, women led VCs. Um, but it still feels very male dominated to me. Anyway, I got to be honest with you. Anybody else, any views in terms of uh, the financial landscape when it comes to raising money as a, as a tech founder? Well, I suppose I can tell, talk on, on, on both sides to some degree. And I, I, I do yeah. find that it is very, uh, very male dominated. I think things are changing, but they're changing very slowly. And I think, you know, having worked across the whole of that, that finance ecosystem from, you know, early stage funders, angels, high net worth individuals, 
now working very much in the VC space, you know, it it, it is male dominated. You know, we, we, we can't say otherwise. I think there's new players coming in and I think there's there's more choice and there's more opportunity. And to, to Caroline's point, you know, that whole education piece and uh, and support piece, I think, is changing. You know, you've got you've got programs like Startup Grind, you know, so you've got a, a lot more support available. You've got things like um, Fund Her North, you know, which which are, are really accessible across across our region, and they're doing great things. And they've got a, a female syndicate that that's popping up now. You've got Angel Academy in in in, in London. You've got Team SY. So you have got these these pockets that are now supporting that you know female founder, female entrepreneur, and that whole diversity piece. Because if you, we're really honest about the statistics, you know, if we look at um, you know black women of color in this space then you know that kind of drops off a, a cliff as well so i think there's there's more work to be done there's more questions that that kind of need to be asked uh, around this 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 whole area i think um i think it is changing i think it is changing and i think to you know to caroline to, to carmen and to sheila you know we've got three strong sort of females here that are kind of quite willing to to um you know you know, ask for the what they want in that space whether it's kind of taking it slowly and taking a, a more holistic um and working with the right kind of angels and i would encourage anybody whether they're looking at angels or vcs um to work really hard um give yourself enough time to make sure you are getting into bed with the right funder at whatever stage of, of, of funding you're looking at you know as you know sure valley we would say we are an entrepreneur led VC, you know, all of our team members, all of our founders come from an entrepreneurial place. And we've actually got a really diverse team, which which I fully celebrate. You've got people like diversity VC that are looking to kind of regulate support diversity within the industry. Um, the base in the South, so one of my questions of them were, you know, they've got some great resources and programs how are they going to distribute that further across the uk because i think it is quite a regional thing as well um so yeah if, if that's helpful from a, a vc perspective i think i think it's exceptionally helpful mel because um back to the, the comments for a second eugene said as well if you take biotech money out it changes it a great deal but i think your point is really very valid because there are pockets of inspiration, maybe if I can use that term. Yes, there are, there are yeah. definite examples we can port to where it where it is changing. But I'm kind of going back to what Sheila said earlier when we were talking about uh, talent attraction and getting, or uh, Carmen, you were saying about hiring hiring developers. Um, the reality on the ground is maybe it hasn't quite filtered through because it is quite pocketed. There are small examples where it's definitely going in the right direction, um, and I suppose, Carolyn, your point as well, I just wanted to go back to that because the, I don't have the stats on how many women-led technology companies pitched for money. And I think that's an interesting barometer, isn't it? Because we can quite easily throw out that look, only 2% or a very small percentage of the overall VC money got shared to, to women founders. But when you look at, well, what's the percentage of women-led businesses looking for money from the VC market or from whatever uh, avenue they decide to go down. I think having that as a comparable would probably help and maybe we can share some of that information after the, the session. But thank you for all those contributions. I'm conscious of time. And when I'm talking about being conscious of time, I want to bring up uh, something that's unconscious and that's the unconscious bias. Because I, I don't think we can have a conversation about uh, this topic without talking about as humans, how we sort of are unfortunately unconsciously biased from many aspects of our lives. And that the, there's a current bias in the tech industry. I think it's been well reported and well documented on, but it is a, it is a contributing factor possibly to the, <laughs> the current gender gap that we've seen. And we can talk about grassroots and education and uh, opportunities. And I suppose, you know, whether it's remote working or broadband connectivity plays, a, plays a part in that, but there's still some facts that I wanted to just put on the table that, you know, there's still a big gap when it comes to payment, you know, the difference between male and female pay, it, there is still a disparity. And we have seen some companies now having to report on that to show uh, that that disparity gap is getting smaller. Um, 
but also there's that there's a there's a lack of minority representation within the tech sector too which we still seem to need to overcome so any thoughts on the unconscious bias that's in tech and uh, your sort of observations on that as as founders and business leaders I can give an example. I um, I was in the technology leadership team for a FTSE 100 company and every year we got together and we did the salary reviews of, of the team. And, um, and I was the only female in the leadership team and um, the guys, you know, started talking about who in the team had done what. And one of the project managers or delivery managers, his project was consistently late, um, it was over budget um and not doing great it was coming back every five minutes for more time and more money and um, we had a, a a woman in the team um who actually was under my vertical and and her project well they both were actually but the woman in um in question was doing an ai type project uh, a project was coming in not only on time and on budget but i also saw that her leadership style was quite exceptional so when the team were working late, she was bringing in biscuits, treats, she kept them motivated, she kept them happy, but she kept her head down. And when it came to grading these two, um, the team went, oh, yeah, well, Steve's a good guy, he's a good guy, we'll give him an exceptional. And Su Susan, you know, she's, she's all right, yeah, we'll give her a, a good... Um, and I, I literally, you know, jumped up and said, what do you need to do besides being a white middle-class male in this team to, you know, to succeed? Um, and, you know, I'm sort of fought for Susan's, um, you know, due uh, recognition. But actually, when I left the company, she came to me and said, you know, how can I really succeed in this team and how can I raise my profile? And I did my advice to her was, unfortunately, you're going to have to go that extra mile. So when we have an all hands meeting and they're looking for someone to volunteer to do a presentation or to do something extra, um then I'm, I'm afraid you're probably going to have to do that but actually it did pay off the year later she got her you know her exceptional grading again and she you know she felt recognized and she got a promotion but you know having to give that advice to a man would be ludicrous because it, it just wouldn't be an issue for them thanks carolyn would anybody else like to expand on that yeah i can give um a bit of a one that was um quite high profile so having just been on the last series of dragon's den and facing the dragons um i got a comment from the new dragon um stephen bartlett um saying basically um even though i've been in tech since i left school basically he said to me you shouldn't be running a tech business you don't have the tech expertise needed to do it you're going to lose all your money, um, basically. And um, he, my my point to that. I mean, I'm no victim. I, I I'm quite happy with the outcome of what happened um, on Dragon's Den. It's been very a tremendous success for the business. Um, right, actually going through that journey. But he would never have said that to a male um, person. You know, on it. Um, he just wouldn't have done it and that is you know it, it and in fact to the point where it felt like conscious bias never mind unconscious bias um in that particular instance and i'm a member of lots of different kind of like founders female kind of business women networks and things and there was uproar in those um those networks how dare he how you know that da, 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 da. um and it just wouldn't have said it. It just would not have said that to a male in the same situation who had been in tech, you know, all his all his working life. Um, so that's my kind of like recent um, experience, if you like. Well, yeah, thanks uh, very much for sharing that that, that insight. I do know Stephen Barlow, a very successful uh, guy in his own right, but then of course Dragon's Den is a huge. Uh, uh, TV success and things like Shark Tank in the US markets as well, for example. But uh, yeah, it is, it is an interesting observation that you that you push out. And I think that particularly on the, the TV shows, not that this is about the TV shows, but they try, I knew that they do try to get uh, some uh, representation uh, across the board. But uh, yeah, it's an interesting comment all the same, for sure. Um, does anybody else want to make any any comments there? Because in technology, 
um, if you have a very uh, a group of people that are all the same it's very hard to build a product in technology or a service in technology isn't it for a global audience because you don't have that diversity that's right and it's really no. easy to build in bias into technology if you've not got that diversity of team so you know you know i look at I look at businesses and kind of think you're at a distinct disadvantage if you don't have a diverse team. Um, and I mean diversity, you know, it, it, in every aspect uh, of the word, you know, it, it makes for better, stronger uh, teams. It makes for better, stronger technology and, and companies. And, and we see that in the in the stats. If, you, if you're talking about unconscious bias, though, you know, and, and, and changing that, it's an uncomfortable it's an uncomfortable concept in the first place, isn't it? Because, you know, it's getting people to accept that you have bias and it is implicit. We all do. So it, 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 it's kind of overcoming that. And I think it's having, you know, better conversations in companies. You know, we, we need to hold ourselves accountable and, and, and I'm, I'm sure we do, but we need to keep challenging it. But within an organisation's culture, you know, you, you're talking about it, doing it at that that level. And, you know, I, I keep referring, I guess, to the, the Leeds ecosystem because it's one that I know um, very well. But, you know, I, I'm really pleased to see people like um, Annette Joseph, who some of you might know from Diverse and Equal, you know, actually not just doing the research because I think, you know, when she went out with her report, there were probably no surprises there, but going to that next level of saying, okay, organizations, then this is what you can actually do about it from a practical perspective and helping um, bring about that kind of transformational stuff that needs to happen within organizations and the culture and i think that's really important and it's not just a one-off thing is it? it's kind of a, a cycle that, that that companies probably need to go through yeah more work to do here i think mel but yeah great great comments i really appreciate them um we're up against the clock here and there's some really important things i want to touch on but i also wanted to just give a quick shout out to um Eva, I think, was talking about a book called Invisible Women by Caroline Criado Perez about exposing data bias in a world designed for men. Uh, that's definitely on the, the to read list. So thank you for sharing that. Um, Caroline, you made me laugh talking about the trunky. Uh, I remember the trunky episode on Dragon's Den. And of course, Sheila was on Dragon's Den with her own business. And uh, Jesse is saying, has anybody got any examples of, of male colleagues actually calling out unconscious bias? Um, so we do appreciate all those. But look, we've talked a lot already. We, we've discussed some of the challenges that we see. We've discussed the financial landscape in VC a little bit. And we, we've now sort of explored unconscious bias. And I want to sort of change direction a little bit as we come almost to the end of this session today. I want to talk about some of the positives and some of the exciting things in the world of technology, because we've got a great panel here. And I'm just very keen for you to share what's exciting you about technology, what's currently exciting you about your business, and what are you most looking forward to, or what are you working on at the moment? So maybe, maybe if we go round, and maybe Carmen, will we start with you? Maybe. Yep, can do. Um, well, I think I touched on it earlier, but one thing that's always excited me about Ivy Tech is, and tech in general, is how technology. Um, especially Eastern Europe, because that's the market we're focusing on, but it's just bringing a completely new standard to a country that, you know, for, for, for many decades was quite poor. And um, being part of that change through technology is exciting because in, I mean, again, I talk about Ukraine, that's where I've worked for the last few years. Um, the, the wages, the opportunities to travel, the opportunities, all our teams work directly with the customers who are usually in the US, UK, Australia, Europe. They're on daily calls with them. They get invitations to meet them. It's a whole new world is opening up to them. This is something that without technology would not be possible at this scale. So I find that, you know, for all people have to overcome, there's also a real um, inclusion happening of because, I think countries like Ukraine have been overlooked for a really long time and um, through tech, because they're just incredibly good at engineering and STEM and um, IT, 
they're kind of on the world map now alongside some other really great Eastern European countries. And um, that's, I find that really exciting. I've always been proud of being part of that. And that's, um, yeah, even now with the war is uh, none of our team members have lost their jobs. And generally, if you're in IT in Ukraine right now, you're, even if you know your customers folded the project, you'll have a job within a few days or weeks again. And we're still recruiting in Ukraine uh, thanks to our customers who trust us with that, which is great. But again, I'm like, what a blessing. And I just, you know, imagine crossing the border with no English, which is something again that IT gives you. Um, and a job like, I don't know, a school teacher and all schools are closed down. It's incredibly hard. So again, IT just opens up a world to, um, yeah, a lot of overlooked people and nations. So that's what's been making me really exciting about my own business and just technology in general. Well, continued success, Carl, with that. And thanks for sharing that. Yes, there are, there are actually some wonderful technology stories coming out of the Ukraine and some technology companies that are really operating in very challenging situations. So thanks for, thanks for sharing some of what's exciting you about technology. Who'd like to go next? I think Mel. I I'm muted first, Carolyn. Oh, Mel's going. Sorry, go on. I think we all went for the mute button at the same time, didn't we? Um, I, I, I think for me, it's it's all the possibilities. I, I, again, you know, I, I, I'll talk from a, a VC perspective. I think, you know, there are a lot of exciting opportunities out there. There's some great companies that we're seeing on, you know, coming along. I think, um, you know, it's the possibilities for change um an opportunity that i find most exciting and i'm really looking forward to seeing more female founders that are ambitious and want to go for that kind of you know if vc funding is right for them i am looking forward to seeing more female founders coming forward with exciting businesses thank you very much indeed mel sheila would you like to go next yeah, can do. Yeah, um, I'm very excited. Having just thank you to Startup Grind Scotland, by the way, for choosing me as one of the people who went across to Silicon Valley to the global conference. Um, and thank you, you know, to the global organization for all of that. But I'm really, really excited about, um, you know, the world of Web3 um and and how i am um setting up you know what we've got at the moment to take advantage and and optimize and be ready um you know for moving into that space i mean we're well set up anyway in terms of we are a personal digital vault um you know uh, etc but there's lots of stuff that um that we're also doing to get a straight through process um on life closed down if you like so i'm really excited about that i'm really excited about you know getting an absolutely brilliant team that's going to help me grow and scale up this business um and and also and and the big thing is getting you know actually making a difference to people um you know and and changing the way you know this this thing works and making it much better removing all the duplication and removing all the unnecessary headache and stress that you have to go through to close through some down someone's life at, at a time of you know real emotional distress um so yeah for making a difference on that would be just fabulous yeah that's wonderful thanks for sharing that uh, carolyn um what's exciting you I think what, what's excited me is what, what tech has given me as a career or, you know, over, over the last 20 years, really, every company needs tech. So, you know, if you are dithering about whether or not to make this your, your choice of career, then I would say do it because, you know, the tech is a given, but then you can choose the industry, the geography where you want to work. So it's afforded me the opportunity to live and work overseas for a number of years, to learn new languages, to travel the world, you know, paid, um, even having worked for an airline where I could fly around the world business class for £100 a, a time. But also, I think it's massively a candidate's market now. So, you know, it is pretty much a license to print money. And, um, and I kind of stepped away when I launched my business. Yeah, there's, there's a tech element, there's e-learning in there. But the pandemic showed that I could just go back after six years out and pick it up just like that. And in fact, I, I bumped into a guy in a pub the other day who was in his 70s who also used to be an IT consultant. And I said, 
the industry is crying out there will be a job for you so if you if you're that way inclined if you are techie then you can always go back to it and it's it's just it just affords you so many opportunities so yeah if you are dithering you do it i think that should be a t-shirt if you are dithering just do it i like that (laughs) (laughs) well look that's been some wonderful advice and i know we're right up against it and there's a couple of people asking if there's another session there is another session following this so stay tuned. Um, I'd like to leave maybe with just a, a very quick piece of advice from each of you. So if you were, if you could share a, a, a piece of advice, what would you put forward as your, your sort of takeaway a session, you know, whether it's about technology or leadership or financing or uh, what, what are your helpful tips? So maybe we go back around. Maybe, Calm, we start with you again, if you, if you have sort of a, a last tip or a bit of advice for our audience today. I think my tip would be to um, intentionally seek out a good advisor, whether that's male or female, but um, I've only recently really had a coach and an advisor to my business. And it's been so life changing for me in in terms of my confidence, just someone there, you know, that knows the business, I can pick up the phone, they know where I'm at. And I didn't have that for many years, except my husband, who's been also very supportive, but just someone outside of my family has been fantastic. So look for an advisor or a mentor and make an effort to find someone that suits you. That's a great, great suggestion. Mel, would you like to go next? Just you know, any sort of parting thoughts or advice? Uh, for the yeah, audience? I'd, I'd, I'd say, um, let's have a thing. You know, th- there's, there's probably going to be challenges. There's going to be no's along the way and, 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 you know, things like this, but I'd say, you know, take each one of them as learning opportunities and growth opportunities. And as a way of, you know, getting stronger, there's always a, a, a way to learn and just be, be brave and be bold and push through and step into the light. I know there's some amazing, you know, females in, in, in tech and, you know, step into the light and be, be role models. Yeah. Wonderful. I love that. Um, Sheila, over to you. Well, it's just, um, you know, adding to what Carmen and Mel have said already and and Carolyn has said in in the the last chat, um, basically just JDI. um, I'd normally have a JFDI in there um, as well, but I'll take the F out for today. But yeah, JDI, right? Um, You know, don't let all these obstacles there are there will be challenges but just keep going right and just and and then you know by the you know so just take baby steps every day towards whatever it is that you you're wanting to do whether it's actually kicking off your own tech business or or you know going into the tech world or um or something like that just keep going because i mean seriously um if i'd have thought about all the things i would have had to gone through when i first started um this business i probably wouldn't have done it but because you're just biting the elephant bite by bite um you know by the time you know you you know you look back and you think oh my god wow look where i am now um you know all these things that i've done and achieved and and then you're on to the next thing um so it's just perseverance patience just take each day as it comes but just keep going and just do it is basically what I'm Thank you, Sheila. And Carolyn, the last word with yourself. Can I? I'll have two if that's all, all right. right. The first yeah. one is ABM, always be mentoring. So always have a couple of people behind you who you can give a leg up to and open doors for and show them the shortcuts. Um, and then personally, learn to sell because I would have scaled my business a lot quicker if I was a bit more eloquent in the way that I was trying to sell. But again, I was learning on the job. So whether that's um, selling your products, selling your um, concept to investors or selling yourself for promotion in the corporate world, I would really just throw everything at it in terms of books, TED Talks, um, training courses, going to conferences, because that's the thing that's going to get you where you want to go faster. Well, we've had some wonderful advice and tips there. I'm sorry we've ran slightly over with session one. Session two is coming up right now, but I just want to say thank you to our panel today. It's been an absolute pleasure and a privilege to spend some time with Carmen, with Mel, with Sheila, and with Carolyn. And with that, I'll hand you back. So thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, It was a very interesting session. Simon, um, you put the bar high. 
Um, I'll bring to the stage the second panel. So while, while, uh, while we're just getting the second session up, it's going to be a, a great panel. We're going to be talking about uh, women's leadership. Uh, we're going to be joined by Karen Jones, Bina Sharma, uh, and Joanne Thurlow for what yes. promises to be a really great in-depth discussion. So I'll hand back to you. Thank you very much, Simon. Amazing. Okay, so you can we, we can see everyone and Karen Jones as well. All right, well, thank you very much. Uh, so uh, we will kick off the second session, Inspiring Women's Leadership. We'll look at uh, how to be leaders and, and what it means, but also how to how to inspire others to, to be great leaders. Uh, we have a wealth of knowledge and expertise in the room. And um, I would like to ask you to, to introduce yourself. Joan, could we start with you, please? Sure, thanks. Um, Joanne Thurlow, I'm representing the Isle of Men, um, which I have the privilege to do now that I live over here. Um, you will have picked up maybe from my accent. I'm not British, I'm actually Canadian but I do live over on this side of the pond. Uh, I am currently a part of a group of management consulting group that is based out of Germany, but we have worldwide coverage where I focus on digital transformation, sustainability, IoT, and ESG, which obviously is a big topic, um, you know, impacting everyone. It's not just the digital transformation. And I had just earlier this year left Siemens Energy, where I had been for 10 years as a global head of IT, managing the IT for one of our business units, um, which was in 40 countries, across 40 countries, and uh, for about 4,000 employees across 40 countries, 1 billion euro business and managing the digital transformation of that business for going forward once we did an IPO. The industry is where my passion for sustainability has really come to the forefront. And being able to marry both my expertise, which is many years in the IT industry, to um, working in the MG industry. So looking forward to what the future is going to bring. So. Thank you Thank very much, Joan. Um, Karen, over to you. Hi, my name is Karen Jones. I'm the Managing Director for Denison Europe and I cover the UK, Ireland and the Nordics. We're a global company with our headquarters in Michigan. Uh, the European office is based in Switzerland and basically we work with clients and partners to make organisational culture tangible. We measure it and then as the last speaker um, discussed, we have honest conversations and powerful dialogue around it. So you bring that inclusive voice of the of every team and every member right through to the board by really being explicit about which culture we have and which culture we'd like to create. Thank you very much. Bina. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm the I'm Bina Sharma. I'm the managing director and co-founder of a company called Imperium Experts. We're a business growth consultancy. Um, I'm also the CEO of a biotechnical company called Biotechnical Scotland. Um, we effectively what we do is we take food waste. Um, and we put it through a number of different processes, technologies. We've got four technologies that we work quite closely with, including carbon capture, anaerobic digestion, um, vertical farming and uh, microbioreactors. And what we do is we take food waste and we turn that into a commodity. So we turn it into a microalgae, which can then be used for the pharmaceuticals, cosmetics industry, animal feed, and of course, plant-based food for, for companies that are looking particularly people who, who are changing over to plant-based diets. Um, I am originally from the oil and gas industry, started in the oil and gas industry at the tender age of 21, 22, fresh out of university, and my first posting was um, Nigeria. So I was in the construction, oil and gas construction, and my per first posting was Nigeria. I was, um, I'm a qualified um, HSC leadership trainer, and um, I guess that experience in itself, I've always come from a very male dominated environment. I'm only fairly uh, recent couple of years into sort of more technology focused business, but um, I've always been surrounded by a very male dominated environment. So it's probably shaped the way that, that certainly shaped the way that I approach things. But yeah, looking forward to this conversation. Thank you very much. All right, well, let's 
before we delve into how to inspire and how to encourage people to, to, to lead, well, let's look at the leadership and let's see how we define it. What do we understand as a good leader? What, what makes a good leader? Um, Karen, could we, could we start with you? <laughs> mm. I mean, for me, it, it has to be systemic and we have to so we talk a lot about balance. There are lots of continuums and dynamic tensions that leaders have to hold and manage. So not only do they have to be really clear on strategy, well, let's start with vision first of all. What's the purpose? What difference are we trying to make? What are the strategic priorities that we're going to set to get us to, towards that vision? And what's the short-term goals and objectives? If we're really clear about our mission, we also have to make sure we're bringing everybody with us. So how do we how do we develop that sense of ownership, sense of responsibility and accountability and real clarity on what is my individual contribution within my daily work towards that 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 inspiring purpose and that strategic direction? Uh, how do we build teams? How do we make sure people are capable? Uh, and then we need to be really clear about the market that we're playing in. So who is our customer? that we you know let's remind ourselves we are each other's customers as we go through the process we have to understand how we're going to manage change and we have to have an opportunity to reflect both when we make a mistake but also when we get it right you know how many, how many businesses stop and applaud success and take a more appreciative inquiry on that and finally for us leaders should be managing that boundary working making sure that they're not rewarding silos or driving silo behavior but we're being horizontally smart that we're managing conflict so we're we're welcoming diversity at a stage before we make a decision once we've made a decision we are in, in encouraging loyalty to that agreement and we all go out in a cohesive voice and finally core values that we have leaders and managers that absolutely know what they personally stand for and what the business stands for and that they make sure that there is coherence between that and when they do not match it people are held accountable you don't send a nice email that says we're sorry to see you go you send a very clear message to say there's not a good core value fit yes thank so you have to do all of that which is which is why it's a lot to do yeah, it's not easy. It's, it's, it's actually quite a lot and all, all your names are uh, huge work and I think it continues development. Um, yeah, well, um, who would like to take? Um, I'll know. go next. Yeah. Um, Karen said some great things there, actually, and I agree with pretty much every single one of them. There are so many aspects to being um, uh, not just a good leader, but one that um, is inspirational, one that is motivational. And there are all these, all these different, all these different words that we've we've seen bounced around, and and there are so many different aspects to it that not one particular leader or one particular style will work for for one particular group of people or one particular individual. The one thing that I will say for me, for me most definitely should and should always remain consistent, um, is leading by example, and uh, that is one of the things definitely in my early days of you know my my focus is uh, come from a psychology background behavioral safety was what i specialized in in the oil and gas industry and one of the things that we would always drill in is that there is no point in asking people to do something that you wouldn't do yourself um and we you know we see a lot of it i mean nowadays we see a lot of it on on social media we see it's completely open to us now so there was no, really no point in somebody walking into a room teaching my staff something or telling my staff or asking my staff to do something and then walking out of the room and doing the complete opposite so it's very much about not just talking the talk but walking the talk walking that talk and that's really that's really for me it's it's as simple as that leading by example and setting that example to be a good example of how you want to run that business how you want to lead that team and eventually how you want that team to move into those roles of leadership Thank you, Bina. Over to you, Joe. I have to agree with everything that's been said here as well. Um, absolutely, it's a great segue to, I think, following up and building on what both of you have just pointed out about. And um, it's really starting, you know, Karen, you're looking at the whole organization and, and, and Bina, you know, you're talking about being that leader. And then maybe what I'll do is I'll focus on a, a little bit on 
what it means for the team and because it's something I'm very passionate about and, and certainly in having a um, I, the, the direct report and what Hunter extended and embracing agile working and getting everyone to understand what they were there for. I really believe that if you understand who you are and what your strengths and weaknesses are, as well as how other people see you, then you can start to also align individuals to become their best and get the ownership. So I've really fostered a culture of ownership within my direct team. They became those leaders that you were just talking about, Bina, and they then subsequently took it out. And we did that by, you know, we all took the same type of training. We created awareness. We had one person who was very senior, for example, who was probably somewhere on the autistic spectrum, low end of the autistic spectrum, but was never identified misconnect put into different roles all the time she has so much value to bring to the team but she was just never put into the right place and by using those profiles and understanding the individuals the teams who was particularly good to go and do a presentation play to their individual strengths and then get them to take total ownership um, and make decisions for themselves which for a germ predominantly german team So for me, uh, that's where a lot of that leadership would come in to get them to also be the leaders themselves and going forward and, and totally empower them to to as if it was their own business. And they really did. We, we managed to very successfully create that culture. So, yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Well, a lot of challenges for, for business owners, for, for, for leaders um, during the, the pandemic, uh, we had to kind of shift to a different type of work. Um, and it's probably the leadership styles might have been affected in, in a way. Would you agree that it's kind of the, the current situation when we've got the hybrid model still calls for more kind of empathetic, uh, empathic leadership and more transparent leadership? Has has anything changed? Do you do you see any any shifts? Who would like to start? Um, um, I guess I'll start. Yeah, yeah. I, so, go ahead. No, no, go go go. go, go. Oh, okay, sorry. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll I'll keep it a bit short. What my experience has been is that yes, the leadership did change. It did become more transparent, and in many ways more human and personal because that aspect of having those meetings where you're coming into your cfos or your ceo's home yeah break down a lot of barriers um challenging for some um, particularly with the older style you know i want to see a bum in seat and then i want to see you there every day and know that you're working and having to accept it um, I think a big culture shift uh, at, the, at the end of the day, but I do think it made it more transparent and more personal and humanized. I mean, we've all seen the videos of the dog barking or the baby stepping in or whatever. And I think that's just been absolutely brilliant because I think, yeah, we've just really needed it collectively. I, I think I would add there, I think it was also quite exposing for some people because if you're if you're calling in from your bedroom you don't have a nice study at home you know i think people did feel very exposed and, and like you joanne it was lovely to see people's children jumping on their laps but there was quite a lot of tension about whether that was okay or not so i think it did invite people into a much more personal space that they're not always connecting with work so that was a lovely invitation but it was very exposing and i think for some people that were less um, extroverted, maybe quite exhausting, quite intense. And I, and I think, as you said, you know, managers that are used to seeing people and having people around, you do have to be much clearer about the goals and objectives you're content with by Friday. Uh, so I think it invited um, a reflection on the level of trust. Mm, that's very good point. Good point. How much yeah. Before, how clear are we? How much do I actually believe they're going to work? Because the reality is, that most people worked more because they they were near their office and their computer. But how much? How, what was the belief and assumptions of managers to actually believe that their team would? So I think it highlighted a whole mixture of different emotional emotional issues that maybe haven't surfaced quite so readily before. 
I think from from my perspective on that is that both Joanne and Karen absolutely valid points and I think from a leaders from a leader's perspective or a leadership perspective um, something needed to change if you didn't already know that it needed to change then that certainly that situation highlighted that something needed to change it certainly closed it closed some of those barriers you know people discovering things about their leadership team that they never knew before um, people discovering things about their employees that they didn't know before having a bookcase behind and spotting a book that maybe you've got some similarities with and in a lot of the training that i do when i focus on sort of leadership supervisory mentorship etc and how these people coach their teams how they coach their their employees um the the focus is a lot on establishing some sort of um some sort of relationship based on maybe it could be a hobby for example maybe it could be in something that you're particularly interested in or something that you do or children etc and that quite often leaders find really hard to do um, and the whole situation of putting us all in our homes suddenly that was no longer protected and you had to step out of that comfort zone you didn't have a choice as a leader you had to step out of that comfort zone and don't forget also as leaders we were going under the we, we were we were struggling with the same issues that our employees were we all had that that bond if you like um, quite a lot of conversations would start with well what's the covid situation what's happening today what are the restrictions today how's that going to affect business so we all understood that from the same perspective and those those hierarchical barriers suddenly disappeared so i think from a leader's perspective it, it encouraged us to step out of our comfort zones where maybe we were very comfort comfortable in our little offices in our in our particular particular building where people would have to knock on the door and come and speak to us it encouraged us to step out of our comfort zone and encouraged us to actually look much more closely at our own leadership style not don't forget as well it's when you're talking on on particularly zoom teams you're looking at yourself and you never do that in person and suddenly you can see your mannerisms, you can see how you react to people, you can see those facial expressions and you can get pulled up on those things. So suddenly you're having to appear to be a different person to what you may have normally been if you weren't facing what I call the mirror. Yeah, thank you. It's a great point. I think um, I, I would say it's changed for, for good. Maybe we had to go out of the comfort zones like you said we were closed by and divided by walls on the other hand we opened the door we had to we had no choice and and it probably brought something something better and into the leadership um i know you've had amazing journeys all three of you and and really exciting careers uh very often transitioning um what i'd like to and what i'm interested in is if there was any particular if there were any particular challenges or a particular challenge that um, that you had on your journey and then a breakthrough moment when it kind of shaped you into uh, into who you are right now so so sometimes we have those moments there's something happens and and the shift comes. So, um, who who would like to start? I, I, I'll I'll share a kind of uh, a, a personal one. You know, I, I I became a single parent, so my breakthrough moment was having to earn more money. Oh. <laughs> I went, I went for a job that I probably wasn't completely qualified for, but I was motivated, and and I have to say she ended up being one of my best female bosses. And the breakthrough moment was he was prepared. Uh, it's the most kind of, um, I think she was very courageous. She said, Karen, you know, I don't think you're the best qualified candidate, but there is something about you that I don't think the other candidates have. Uh, and I think what you don't have, I can teach you. And what you do have, we can really utilize in the business. So she took a gamble and she said, I'll, I'll, I'll take you on a six month trial. I'm not going to pay you the full salary because I'm not sure you can do it. But if I think you can do it, then actually we'll we'll review that in six months. And she was good to her word. She took that risk. She took that gamble. She made it very clear as a single parent. Um, it was in public health. So when there was a crisis, I do need you here. So just tell me you can cover childcare. But, you know, if there's no crisis, I'll trust you to manage the job as you need to manage it. So it was really... 
you know, the breakthrough was I had to, I had to uh, let go of my self-limiting beliefs because I knew I'm not sure whether I could do the job either, but I stepped into that space. I kind of owned what I could bring to that job. And then I learned so much from her. She was one of the best bosses I've had. So, and then the system took her out, sadly, because she was too clever and too smart. Uh, and that's, that's the tragedy. So let's, let's have cultures that don't do that anymore. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you very much for sharing that, Karen. That's, that's really, I, I think, one of those moments when we are scared to do something and then actually it changes everything and, and you take a different path. So very inspiring. Um, could I, like I to can go next. Um, yes, yeah, I think um, for me, one of my breakthrough moments, I've had, I've had a few actually, um, and a lot of them have been um, upon self-reflection. Um, I always considered myself to be, you know, um, a, a nice boss, if you like, um, kind and all the rest of it. But I, but several experiences, I began to realize actually some parts of me that I didn't like. Um, and it was situations where I was put in very challenging positions or maybe there were individuals in the business that weren't performing that I knew was crucial to the success of the business. Um, and suddenly I found myself, you know, speaking in ways and doing things that mm -hmm. that I would normally frown upon. So there was a lot of, you know, looking at oneself. There was a lot of that. So I had a fair few breakthrough moments in some of those. And, and certainly as a business owner, when you're put at that level, you know, the stress is unbelievable that you go through. I mean, I think everybody on here that's, that's you know, started up a business, run a business, etc., will agree it's a very lonely place. And you take on full responsibility for everything right the way through from day to day operations to sales to sometimes taking the bins out. You know, it's there's no definition yeah. of what a managing director or a CEO or a founder of a company does. And you take that responsibility and you take it on very, it becomes very personal. So I think one of the breakthrough moments I had is it, certainly in one of my companies, I had, you know, a sales manager that wasn't performing. And I knew that if a time came where there was no performance and I was going to keep doing the sales as I was doing, um, it would either come to breaking point or the company would, I would fail to be able to, to maintain the remaining employees in the company and put food, who rely on their jobs to put food on the table. And that taught me a number of different things about myself. And I did certainly self reflect on that. Mm -hmm. I think another breakthrough moment for me was um, actually understanding um, how as a woman I was, uh, I think I grew up not realizing how being a, a female um, or, and certainly a female of color could affect um, how people treated me and the, the kind of positions potentially I could take up and the kind of authority I could demand. And, you know, when I went out to Nigeria, certainly I spent two years um, living in Norway on a gas plant and and I was out there to train people and, you know, I was out there to lead people into doing things a certain way. And I had to change the way that they thought, the, change, the way that they behaved. And a lot of the being in construction, certainly in Nigeria, it was me and 6,000 men on that LNG plant. Mm -hmm. And I suddenly, it dawned on me that actually if I needed to not be me almost, um, in order to be accepted for who I was. And I went through that for many, many years. And it dawned on me after a number of years that actually I don't need to change who I am. I am who I am and I should be accepted. So that took a while. And that could be down to the fact that I was very young when I started out in the construction industry, you know, fresh out of university. I faced many, many challenges. I, one example, which I quite often use, you know, somebody said to me, right, where's, where can we send you? When I first joined this oil and gas company, they said, where, right, my boss said, where can I send you? Um, I can't send you here, I can't send you here, I can't send you here. And I actually really wanted to go to one location. And he said to me, well, you're the wrong color, you're the wrong sex, you're the wrong age, and you're not an engineer. And I kind of went, okay. And when you, th and I accepted it. And when you think, you know, if somebody said that to me now, it would be a completely different stro story for me. But, and I realized how it had potentially it could have hampered my 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 growth and my personal growth my personal leadership and it came to a point where it was that almost breakthrough moment where right that's it I've had enough I'm not doing this anymore I'm credible as I am um and I pitched myself and I was put out there and it just went it just went rocket you know rocketed from there so I think for me um there's a lot of learning points from that but most certainly I think in one's life you should have a number of different breakthrough moments if you are going to change and develop for, for the better. Yeah.
Thank you. Thank you for sharing that, Bina. Um, yep. Joan. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll pick up from there. And um, yeah, I, I totally agree. There's breakthrough moments throughout your entire life, and I've had many of those that, that have helped shape who I am today. But more importantly, I guess where I am today, starting with a personal um, situation about 16 years ago, having divorced with my ex-husband having his midlife crisis and taken up with another woman. Um, I thought, well, if he can have a midlife crisis, so the hell can I? And um, I had always wanted to live and work abroad. Um, so I knew one person in the UK. I was working at a director level in Canada. I walked away from it all. I had no job, no visa, no business. And I came over to the UK and I thought to myself, you know what, either it's going to work or it's not. And if it doesn't, it's a one-way ticket back to Canada and my family's got my back and I can pick it up when I, when I get there. Within 15 years, I had gone from, uh, because where I had been a director before, I had to sort of step back and build up my network. So I started in, in middle management, project management. Within 15 years, I found myself as a global head of IT for Siemens Energy, as I mentioned earlier. Um, you know, and it was just within within that point. And now I have my first uh, non-director board position as well as a board advisor. So it's con through all of that. I'd have to say I've really learned just how much I know and how capable. I am because you know that went from living in the UK to moving to Norway to Germany and now over here and the amount of confidence and belief in myself is considerable in that time period but there was a couple of other moments in in there one was when I moved into this the global head role my then manager I still had that tendency particularly as a Canadian to Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I don't have that answer. I don't have this. And if he kept saying, we stop saying, I'm sorry, because you just give your power away. And as I came to understand what that simple, what I took as a Canadianism, had a big impact on how other people perceived me in terms of my leadership and my authority. And right now I'm into another one of those sort of transitional moments, having left the corporate world and now stepping out into doing it on my own and being independent and starting my own business very timely for me and very encouraging and um so yes yeah. so to, to just step it out and let's take that deep breath and if i could manage all of that i'm sure i'll manage this as well so yeah a couple of, definitely a few pivot points along the way for sure yeah there was a an interesting question actually that kind of um um links to, to what we are talking about about uh imposter syndrome have you ever experienced that because obviously right now we see top women who are very successful and and confident uh but i think we all have those moments i definitely do um hi all right I'll come in there. I, I kind of connected with what Bina was saying about realizing that hey I don't have to turn into somebody else to to actually show up uh, as I am. And yeah, of course, imposter syndrome, yes, those self-limiting beliefs. Uh, particularly, I think, you know, in the past I've worked with very strong male characters. Uh, and kind of, you know, I, I lost a colleague very quickly two years ago, and I um, you know, he died very sadly, uh, and I had to step in. I had to step in to, uh, to his space, and actually, um, I had no choice, so I couldn't allow self-limiting beliefs to get in the way because there was an imperative to look after the team and, and step up. And actually, in stepping up, I kind of realised what I was capable of and what I had kind of putting, putting to the back. And I think... When I do uh, 360 leadership assessments, I can generally guess when one's going to be a female because th their self-assessment has a lot less colour than the assessment of everybody else. And generally, the males are the opposite way around. Now, you know, uh, but there, there's, there's no self-regard in both those cases. They just show up very differently. Yeah. And I think... You know, I'm now really interested in the concept of, you know, the wounded leader. How do we step into that space, knowing our wounds, 
really being clear about the scars that we have, what created them, you know, how deep they go, and actually giving everybody else permission. While we're trying to do the do, there is the being behind it, the humanness. Yeah. And now, you know, maybe it's because I'm turning 60 this year, you know, I now kind of feel, actually, I'm okay. <laughs> Everybody else is okay, but let's let's turn up with some authenticity, some acceptance of uh, of my vulnerability. I will only speak for myself. And actually, you know, I, I think Beanie, you said, you know, lead by example. It all depends on your example. Some leaders are leading with an example that you wouldn't want other people to follow. Yeah, that's so, the point. You know, I want to lead by an example to say, yes, I, I know my tender bits. I know when I'm scared. Uh, and I will try and name that emotion as accurately as I can. If I think I'm angry, as actually I'm frightened, it's much harder for me to work out why I might be there. So for me, it's, yeah, the glorious bit maybe about getting older is, you know, I care about people, but unless their opinion of me is, is a lot about their opinion of themselves. Uh, and I find that quite comforting. Thank you. I have to agree with that. So I see Karen you. And, yeah. Yes. Yeah, I, I, um, I, I totally agree with everything Karen had just said. And I do think part of it is also the being. Um, she be 60 as well. So, you know, and, and you do as you go through and you're in the trenches and you, you gain that, that confidence. You, I think you're, that, that imposter syndrome is there for many of us at earlier stages of our life. But as we get further down the line, We've developed more confidence. We don't. People think if someone once said to describe the 50s when women hit start to hit the change, it's like the FU 50s. And I think that goes into a lot of our, our, our thinking, and that makes us more our authentic self. And then when we do that, we allow other people to show up. It was one of the things with my team that they often refer to, I humanized all that we were doing and I kept it really personal and they just so appreciated it because they felt that they were truly valued and seen for who they were and be, be yourself absolutely um yeah. you know i think um going to the point of kind of imposter syndrome i think I th I'm, I'm not sure you'd be fully human if you never experienced imposter syndrome. Um, and people used to say to me, you know, I'm a, I'm a trainer and I've trained, you know, people all over the world, all different cultures. And even to this day, when I go up and I, I train or I present or, you know, I do have those butterflies in my stomach. And people will quite often come up to me and say, oh, you're a great trainer or you're a great speaker, great presenter. And I will say to him, oh, really? I was actually really quite nervous. And they get really surprised the fact that I still get nerves. And I say to people, if you don't get nerves, you know, even if you've been doing it 20, 30 years, and I've been doing this for more than 20 years now, but even if you've been doing it 20, 30 years, if you're not getting nerves, that means that there's no, there needs to be an excitement there. And those, that day when, when, when there are no butterflies in your stomach, and I said, the trick is really to get those butterflies to fly in formation. Um, but you should always have those butterflies. And if you've got those butterflies, there is every chance of that imposter syndrome creeping in um but the more chance you give that imposter syndrome of creeping in the more likely that imposter syndrome will creep in and quite often what i say is it's um you know and jo joanne and i spoke about this a couple of days ago but it's to do with your mindset it's to do with whether or not you accept something as a challenge uh, whether or not you let your sort of past experiences bad experiences determine how you do things next um, and for me, certainly, you know, I, I view every experience that I've gone through, um, many not so good, because let's be honest, you know, particularly founders, leaders, etc. We've had to experience some of the bad stuff to get to where where we are now. And chances are, we will still have other experiences. But the idea is that you you think about all that stuff that you've gone through in the past whether it's in your personal life or your work life or as a leader or as you're building your career and you ensure that you're taking all the good the good out of that and making sure that you, you learn from that and you understand that okay well that wasn't a particularly good experience however what i learned from this experience was this and going forward i won't do this next time um so i think as far as imposter syndrome goes 
the reason why it, it comes in, the reason why it's there is because there is a fear of something there. There is a fear of something going wrong, a fear of us not uh, thinking to ourselves that maybe we can't do this, um, a fear of failure, a fear of people laughing at us, whatever that might be. That imposter syndrome is only there because you fear that you may not be able to rise to the challenge. And that comes from your mindset. And that mindset comes from the history of whatever it is that you've you've gone through. So the key really here is to change your, change your way of thinking and really start thinking about surround yourself with people who are positive. Surround yourself with people who enjoy a challenge. And certainly don't surround yourself with people who are the same as you because what you want to do is you want to be able to fill those gaps that you can't and ultimately if you've got a team of people around you who are all the same you, you'll never know what you're doing what you need to do differently and it's the definition of madness doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result well if you do have the same people around you then yes there will there will that will happen at all times and this is why i'm quite um i often think about it is if i want to be really challenged, then what I should be doing is looking at bringing on people who are different from me. And you can only do that by really including people who are diverse. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's also challenging yourself. So surrounding by the people who challenge you. And they say that you're, uh, you know, you, you become who you're surrounded by. So, so exactly, but also changing because your journeys show that the moments when you challenge yourselves, you you go a level higher or a few levels higher. Now, I was looking at some statistics um, from Grant Thornton and um, looking at women in, in leadership positions. So what I found there, because, um, you know, I, I, I had some ideas, but I wanted to see whether actually they are, they are true. So women hold 30, 31% of global mid-market leadership roles. 8.2% of Fortune 500 CEOs are women, and less than 1% of Fortune 500 CEOs are women of color. Uh, now, I, I would like to hear your views. Why, why do you think this is the case? Is it that the barriers that the women are you know, facing? Or is it maybe uh, their self-limiting beliefs inside us that we create for ourselves to put ourselves you know to to toughen up and and put ourselves from the very start at that leadership position because very often we go to a meeting when we see the woman like i will take up notes and automatically everyone thinks oh so so she, she was going to do the admin job uh, if you know what i mean so so i'd like to to hear what what your thoughts on that are Karen, I see <laughs> nodding over yeah. to you. I mean, my instinctive thought is, you know, maybe, maybe some women just make a smart choice and, and don't want to be CEO because it's lonely and it's difficult. And actually, there are better things in life. I'd rather be out in the lakes walking and I want to finish work at six. So, you know, I, I kind of think women have a choice. You know, I, I, I'm not going to I'm not going to define my life whether or not I've made it to CEO. I have no interest in making it to CEO personally. And I'm certainly not going to do that now. I have an interest in being inspired, in learning, in knowing what my core values are and living them authentically. So I just like to kind of you know, there isn't one measure of success. Mm -hmm. So let's be clear on that. Uh, you know, I think what when when the issue becomes an issue is when a woman wants to get to that position and she's held back or she's or she's you know discriminated against. So you know, and I, I wouldn't. I, I'm not sure I have the the perfect answer for why that's happening. You know, we've talked about unconscious biases. We've talked about who has the decision authority and how we challenge that. We've also talked about our own self doubt. So. There's an invitation to be really clear, what choice am I making and is it the right one for me or am I holding myself back? Um, and if I am holding myself back, then, you know, we had that great advice about getting coaching, getting mentoring, you know, who who's holding who back uh, and what needs to be done about that? I would be really clear on that, but let's not, not every woman has to go to the same place. I, I agree 100% with Karen. I think it's a it's a combination of a number of things. Um, and that, as Karen said, it could be personal choice. Um, yes, I'm, I'm not going to lie and say that there, there aren't any barriers out there because there are. 
um, and we all know they're there. Um, and some some people, some women do choose that it's not for them. Others others decide that it's too those barriers are too difficult to to climb. Um, and you know, it's for me. I believe it's a combination of a number of different things. There's no one thing that can define why those statistics are what they are. Um, I also, you know, something that Karen said about sort of values. Um, and success. And I quite often will say that we, you know, uh, something I heard from somebody a while back was we, we shouldn't actually be measuring us measuring ourselves by our success, because actually success, the, the goalposts for success are constantly moving, you know, you, mm -hmm. you want to buy, you want a bigger house, you want a bigger house, you want a bigger house, and it never quite ends. And that's why, as humans, we're possibly never really satisfied. Um, however, what I do think would be more beneficial is for us to measure by the value that we bring to something, um, the value that we bring to a business, the value that we bring to our families, the value that we bring to our, our friends and our colleagues and the people that work for us and the people that work around us. So that for me really is, is, is you know, my thinking behind it. And I think that definitely, you know, when women are thinking about moving into it up up these these ladders and into positions that that they um that they think they need to be um because as as karen has said you know being you know running a company is is a very lonely stressful it you know it's um it, it ages you in more ways than one and not necessarily in good ways um and the race to get there is you know what happens when you get there which is one of the reasons why a lot of people are not fulfilled um because you don't want the next challenge or you want the next goalpost for success so really the key thing is to is for for us to think about what it is that we really want out of life and what it is that we are bringing in terms of value um, and that in itself should be enough for us at any given stage in our careers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joan. And again, um, valid points in, 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 uh, from, from both aspects. And I do think it's very multifaceted. I agree completely. There's just no one thing. There are barriers at all levels. I think starting personally for what a woman thinks she's capable of doing, what she wants to do, it could be at a family level because of the commitments. And then it goes into the organization that they're involved in. There's going to be barriers in through there for whatever reason, many of which we've already spoken about here, but also within industries. And very much firsthand of the barriers of the industry and also government policy. And all of these come to play um, that impact whether a woman goes down that path or not. And, and you know, going to Karen's point, yeah, being a CEO, it, it's a big, it's a big sacrifice. You, you, if you want all of that, you have to be prepared to sacrifice something else. And not all women want to do it. I think it's a personal journey. I think you need to plan. and obstacles to overcome and at some point in time in your life that you need to say okay am i going to continue to fight the good fight or am i going to take another path what is it that is the best way for me to go forward but i think is i think the talking about it and being aware of it is one of the things that just helps people to start to make a more personal conscious choice as to what what path they want to take yeah well thank you um so for those women who, who decide to, to take up those leadership roles, whether as a CEO of a company or joining boards, um, a couple of days when we had ago when we had those one-to-one uh, -one call or group calls uh, to, to talk, we discussed the challenges in the boardroom, where in some of the boardrooms, uh, you're the only woman <laughs> and you're not always listened or heard or you know the, the the all types of situations so i'd like to i'd like to ask you to to to, to give any advice a, a, an advice to anyone who might be in that position how to toughen up but also we were talking about you know the positive sides of being the only woman in a leadership position so you know to, to look at that in in both ways so so how to how to help if, if I'm in a position like that, how, how can I help myself to, to be hurt at the same time? Uh, you know, what, what's positive about it? And I'm sure we, we can list a few things. 
Uh, I'd, I'd like to go first, if that's okay. Um, yeah. I think one of the most important things is to um, be conscious of the fact that we should never overcompensate um, for being the only female in that boardroom. Um, and sometimes we try to, or we can do, we can try to do things that um, requires, you know, because we think we need to, we, maybe we need to shout louder, maybe we need to speak more, maybe we need to do certain things to get noticed. Um, I've had mostly mostly positive experiences, and I, and the reason why I say that is because I've always seen me being being different. Um, quite often the only female, but also quite often the only, the only person of color. Um, I've often seen that as as something that has given me strength, um, and something that has allowed me to be heard because I am different and because I bring a different perspective. So I think once again here, I think it's a lot to do with your mindset. Certainly other people in that particular position may not have absorbed it in the same way that I did. Um, but then again, that's that's determined by, by your mindset. Am I going to turn this into a positive or am I going to shrink like a violet? Or am I going to overcompensate? And you hear it all the time. You hear people saying it all the time. Oh, you know, she's that much more louder because, and she gets away with it. Or you, know, you get these kind of comments. And I think as people, if you are genuine, and again, this goes back, Karen has said it quite a number of times now, genuine authenticity. If you come across and you are genuine, then you will be heard. And I think that lots of other people come across lots of different challenges, but ultimately everybody in that boardroom knows the difference between right and wrong. And everybody, although there may be unconscious biases there, there will be others in the room that will pick up on that. And what I'm finding more and more in my career is that actually, uh, you know, women can be very supportive, great, but actually it's the men that can be more so supportive and I've had occasions where men have actually spoken up on my behalf because of the way I have been spoken to or the way that I have been treated I mean not that I wouldn't speak up myself but normally it's before I can even open, open my mouth and those people have been for me the biggest ally the, the very same people that we think that we're having to fight against to get these positions and get these seats these are the people that actually have have given me a voice um, and I think these are the types of organizations, certainly when we when we go in and apply for jobs, et cetera, these are the types of organizations we should be looking at. How supportive actually is the culture there for women? And, you know, it may not necessarily be represented right now on the board or in the leadership team, but if there is a voice there for you and it helps you to be heard, then 100% much, much better for you. Thank you, Bina. Sorry, go ahead there. I was, I was just gonna, I was just gonna pick up on the term. I was just gonna pick up on the term toughen up. You know, I don't think it is a question of toughening up. You know, there are there are masculine principles and there are feminine principles. I know I have a lot of masculine principles that, that I that, that I exude, and I also want to tap into my feminine. Men have the same, uh, and I think you know it's not about colluding, it's not about joining. You know, if a space is a bit toxic, or disregarding, or disempowering, I think it's about standing in your courage and actually holding that space, not joining the toxic, blaming um, kind of habit to say, actually, here's where I am, here's how I feel in your presence right now. And maybe if I feel that in your presence as a senior person around this table, how will other people feel? Well, I have to accept that I'm generally an external coming into these spaces, so it is probably much easier for me to really I kind of feel I'm paid to have those really difficult moments and to manage them. And my career is not so determined by them. I might lose the client, but I'm not going to lose my job. Yeah. And I accept that it's much easier for me to hold that space. But actually, I, I have never experienced really severe pushback on it. Most of the time, you can feel everybody else in the room saying, thank God somebody has just said that, because we've been wanting to say it for weeks. So there is something you can learn the skills to hold that space in a way that protects you and indeed makes it land much more easily with other people and, and their skills you can learn. Again, brilliant points from both of you. Um, I totally agree with them. Um, 
I do think there are challenges and times when, as the only woman, it is advantageous or I do believe that the majority of people don't consciously try to counter that. But there are times when you will encounter that type of bias. Um, and you do need to, as you say, hold your own space, speak up, don't compromise yourself, still bring your authentic self. Um, sometimes what I've had happen and, and you know, you, you go into the room and you just know they're thinking, yeah, tick in the box, we've got the woman, the diversity thing. And, and occasionally what I've done is jokingly have said, okay, if I, as I read the room and if I get a sense that that's coming across, then I might speak up and say, about the tick in the box, the diversity, yes, I do all of that, but I'm actually here because of all I to be here. So shall we move on? And do it sort of in a funny way that's not challenging them. The other thing that I, I, I do, and as um, what I might suggest other people do, is again, I don't believe most people are consciously trying to be um, obstructive. And if you do find that someone is pushing, what I often will do is go aside, take, a, take them aside and just have a friendly little chat and say, you know, this is how, you know, I feel. And give them the opportunity to be aware. In most cases, they will not realize that's what they sounded like. And then if it continues, you get to a point where maybe you really do need to raise um, raise the issue. And I have been in that situation as well, even at the, at the very senior level, where you know you either had a very misogynist male, and you've had to deal with that. Um, I remember once when I first moved into this role and, and sitting with, which is a good balance of men and women, so predominantly male, but very traditional male dominated industries. And I remember sitting there thinking, I, I made the comment out loud about the level of testosterone and how high I was getting off because you had six different leaders of their own markets and the men were just, you know, bouncy, bouncy. And it made a point to all of them that that's how they were coming across. They hadn't realized it. And um, it did help to change by speaking up to actually start to change that dynamic as well, so that it became a more cooperative as um, because in, in our business, you know, we had six different vertical markets and they all had their part to play, but they were really competing against each other rather than working together. And it really came across. So it's just being prepared to again, speak up, as you say, hold your space for sure. Yep. Thank you. Well, we, we, we're getting to the close of the event, but I have one final question. So let, let's do it quickly. Um, as, we, as we close the event, what is the final thought that you would like the audience to, to take away with them? If there is any, any, any for, a, a takeaway for, for the listeners, something that... Uh, build you up helped you yes Karen please yeah for me leadership has to start with self-awareness spend some time with yourself Absolutely. You know, know what your triggers are know what your what your best day and your worst day looks like and and be at peace with yourself and accept yourself first and then be prepared to be authentic and share who you actually are with others thank you yeah I think it's important that you need to praise yourself and you do well and forgive yourself if it doesn't go as well also. And for me and, 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 and building on what you've just said, Karen, is I am a true believer, not only in the self-awareness, but getting out of your comfort zone. At least once a year, I try to do something completely off the wall, like walk on fire or jump out of an airplane or whatever, just to get out of my comfort zone, because that way I start to get out of my way. And I think that's really important as well. Yeah, that's how we grow. Yeah, exactly. Um, interesting, Joanne. Yeah, I'm exactly the same. I will do stuff that will completely challenge me um, that most people would never even dream of. Um, yeah. But I do think that um, it's important to to remain um, uh, genuine and authentic um, and, you know, understand that uh, as, as humans, you know, yes, we are there to lead by example, etc. But we also have our own faults. 
um, and we need to recognize that we're not necessarily perfect or right every time and that's really important one of the things i do want to address is somebody actually asked, did ask a question in the chat about um he said he was quite concerned that we all sound like we're doing it on our own um uh, with other leaders just to talk to once a month or so yes it does sound like we're doing it all on our own but we're not um, and I think I speak for for Karen and Joanne probably here there's a lot that we do do on our own but ultimately I for me the way that I am able to do what I do is because of my support network and I would never recommend do it on doing it on, I've been there done it on my own and then I've had co I've had a co-founder and it has been so much more so much easier to make decisions so much easier to to ensure that you can bounce your ideas off, et cetera. And also the teams, the people that you surround around you doesn't necessarily have to be those that you work with or are in a business relationship with. You know, there's there's family, friends, et cetera, that can all be supportive. There are so many support networks out there. And for me, what, the one thing that stands out, I think for me is, I've only really connected quite recently with Startup Grind. And I was actually, um, much like Sheila on the previous panel, um, I was selected um, to go to Silicon Valley and pitch in Silicon Valley. Um, and this network has been phenomenal for me. Thank you. Uh, like a, when I applied for it, I had never even heard of Startup Grind. So it has been phenomenal. And even though I'm relatively new in tech, it doesn't necessarily have to be in tech, but the network and the people are all looking for the, the same, you know, we're all looking for the same things. We all want support. We're all maybe a little bit lonely in our journeys. We want somebody to go to to ask questions, etc use your networks if there's one thing i'm going to leave you is use those networks because everybody is in the same boat and everybody wants to achieve the same things out of it so the networks can be where you can find your day-to-day -day support or your family support maybe isn't there or isn't quite what you wanted it to be jump on and speak to some of the some of the guys in the startup grind complete strangers you will get so much support there that's kind of the last thing that i wanted to leave that at well Thank you very much, Bina. That's, that's amazing to hear. Um, I, I know the Scottish team has been extremely supportive. I, I mean, flying 20 scale-ups to, to Silicon Valley, it's, it's, it's an amazing achievement. Um, but all chapters are, are trying to, to feed into the ecosystem, really. Well, it's been um, an enormous pleasure to talk to you. We could continue and, and carry on and on. And um, I'm, I'm sure we, we would come up with loads of questions and actually more more thoughts to share. Um, but we, we are um, actually behind with time. I brought Simon to the stage um, just, just to ask to see if uh, there is any final thought that you would like to share with us before we depart. <laughs> Well, I, I think it's been a fabulous uh, event. Thank you so much indeed uh, for all of the speakers today. I think both the first session and the second session have been uh, quite uh, broad, uh, yet at the same time offered real insights into people's businesses and how people think. Uh, and I've, I've actually been putting a few comments in the, in the chat as well with some great things that have been said uh, throughout today's session. So. I mean, from, from my side of things, I think we've really explored quite a number of topics today. And I think this UK Women in Tech Summit event has been um, a, a great uh, activity to be involved in. And I can't wait to, to get the recordings and to share it far and wide. So thank you so much indeed to everybody. It's been a, it's been a great pleasure. Yeah, yeah, we had a... We had a we had a slight te a technical challenge, I think, a, a couple of times now. But uh, look, it, it's been fantastic, and I hope everybody has enjoyed uh, the event today. So we've heard from Joanne and Karen, and uh, of course Bina, who shared some wonderful insights from their own uh, experience and careers. And uh, I think that was particularly uh, impressive. And I also wanted to thank everybody who's been involved and for everybody who's tuned in from the audience perspective because we've had some great questions haven't we throughout the event today uh, which is really really uh, good i think we're at the end of time here and uh, we're, we're slightly over so apologies for that for everybody but we do hope you've enjoyed it we hope this startup grind event has been uh, good and that you've enjoyed listening to the speakers today i do want to finally just encourage everybody to reach out to the speakers and of course, to reach out to Startup Grind. I know, Bina, there you were discussing the 
the Silicon Valley trip and what what a what a beneficial the organization has been to you. And Startup Grind, it truly is a global organization. So check it out online. It's very easy to find and get involved. So thank you very much indeed to everybody who's here today. I think we'll bring it to a close. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for having us.